question. Um, I'll just give you a, <coughs> a quick um, overview of just one area that I think is uh, sometimes overlooked in, um, in these discussions about low-carb diets and stuff. Is about why is it so sometimes difficult to stick to a low-carb diet? And if you look at some of the um, some of the, the studies which have been done in the area in diabetics, for example, putting them on ketogenic diets, that there's often a, a high fall-off rate, and um, sometimes only you know 25, 50 percent of the patients stick to the diet. Um, and I think addiction can help us understand some of that. So I'm trying to keep away from the fancy science and just uh, think about having a look around our, um, our world. This is my son Patrick. And I found in the early years of being a parent, getting him to eat his greens and a bit of meat was a bit of a trial. But for some reason, uh, a bit of sugar would just switch on that motivation and um, get him enthused about eating. And it started me thinking about motivation. Uh, this is a dairy, um, not a good place to go if you're on a low fat, uh, sorry, <laughs> a low carb, high fat, uh, low sugar diet. There's pretty much sugar right in front of the cash register um, in the ice cream and 20% of ice cream is sugar. Uh, breakfast cereals, 20, 30, even more than 40%, I think some of that, probably that Milo one. Um, and then the drinks cabinet. So you see that if you want to make a profit from selling stuff on the street, the things that people tend to go for are the sugary stuff. You know, we see it all the time. If you just wander up to the top floor here, you'll see what um, we, how we used to buy our food in a, a general store in Auckland at the turn of the century, and uh, many fewer sugary items on sale. In fact, not much on sale at all. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, we've got on top of this, I think. You know, Auckland City Hospital is a good place to get your um, uh, low carb, high fat um, stuff. Oh, fantastic. So we'll just have a quick look at addiction. And um, so, so what is addiction? It's, it's about loss of control. It's about wanting to do one thing and actually doing another thing. And some of you might be able to relate to that with diet. I certainly could. I, I wanted to cut my carbs down. I wanted to cut the sugar down. But something was nagging at me to... to this sort of monster on your shoulder that wants to keep you going uh, down the old track. Some people describe addiction as an appetite for drugs. So there's that link between appetite and um, drug use. Um, I, I used to, I've talked at a lot of, in, in front of a lot of medical audiences and asked them why do people smoke? And it's, it's, it's amazing that not many people know, uh, not many doctors know why people smoke. And, and, and the answer is, what happens when they try and stop? They feel a bit jittery, but they start craving. They, they often describe it as just not feeling right. And they know that the only thing that's going to make them feel right again, straight away, is a cigarette. And you often see it, you know, smokers that are a bit irritable in the, in the meeting, can't smoke, nobody's going to let him, and then eventually the meeting's over, rushes out, get a cigarette, and had one, one puff, and he's right again. And, uh, and you see the same thing with food. You know, you see people sort of a bit jittery, irritable, um, getting managed to work the um, the vending machine, get their M and M's, 
I'm right again. And we, we, if you think about this process, it's a bit like the joy of taking off tight shoes. You know, yet sort of, um, you feel irritable. You can't quite identify what it is that's annoying you. You've got some sort of thorn in the side. And then you finally, oh, yes, that's right. I'm okay. And it sets off this sort of subconscious kind of um, learning. And we know that addictive things, if we compare cigarettes with sprays and gums, we know that addictive things give you a nice swift hit, uh, and they tend to be concentrated. Uh, and cigarettes give a very fast hit of nicotine compared to uh, things which are uh, absorbed over the skin or the the, um, the the lining of the mouth compared to the lungs. The lungs have such a massive blood flow, they, they get the nicotine in there very quickly. Um, Atkins, I credit him with m helping me think about this aspect of addiction. I I <laughs> yes, yeah, I had to sort of gently ease them into it the other day by saying this is medical pornography, you know, this what was at the time. Um, I thought it was at the time, but actually I thought now I see it's very enlightened. Um, is a, an executive Atkins described, um, and I think this is important to, to, to listen to what patients are saying, and I'm often guilty of that in my own little sort of numbery world of epidemiology. Um, talked about this executive who tried everything, obesity surgery, laxative diets, everything, and he'd say, often I would shake until I could put some sugar in my mouth. So that sort of agitation and then... Oh. And this is just a typical uh, description of opiate um, withdrawal. And he talked about these cues, restaurants, candy machines, soft drink dispensers that would, would get him to... Um, uh, would set off this behaviour. Um, we know a little bit about the reward centre associated with other drugs. We see similarities with sugar and other carbohydrates. Um, we know from animal studies sugar reliably induces withdrawal fat, doesn't The other interesting thing that, we, uh, that I think adds a little extra dimension to this is that addiction tends to destroy our ability to control our impulses. Um, and we get these sort of automatic behaviour and we, we find it hard to sort of interject with, um, uh, with rational thought. Oh, I'll just skip this quickly. Um, and we know that sugary drink intake is, is strongly associated in epidemiological studies with violence, suicidal behaviour, cognitive uh, reduced cognitive development and um, an ability to to concentrate, attention deficit. And, and this, I think, is evidence that, that goes along with this addiction property. And, and you see that this would have been a great study to do for uh, kids who, who drink more than four sodas a day, 154% uh, more likely to destroy belongings of others compared to none. The, those who drink none. And, and this is, um, I think, evidence of this sort of lack of impulse control that goes along with a uh, sugary drink um, with that addiction. So in terms of how can this addiction stuff help us? Well, to me, at a personal level, the interest is tr controlling the environment. So. Um, Having sugary stuff, having high carb stuff uh, packed away in the pantry is really asking for it. Um, if you can control your your personal environment, it's just the same approach that we take with tobacco. Getting people off cigarettes, um, we tend to um, tell them to get rid of their, their secret stashes and their their um, their ashtrays, lighters, all that stuff. Um, Eric Westman, who's a uh, low-carb man in, in the States, sort of shows what happens when you... Which I think people kind of relate to in the low-carb community, this kind of low-carb flu that um, people talk about. 
where they get these cravings, this fatigue and this moodiness, which uh, uh, reduces after about two or three months, um, which is typical of addictions. You know, you'd see the same sort of pattern, somebody coming off alcohol or opiates. So just to tie things up, uh, addiction theory explains the central role of sugar and carbs in our food supply. Uh, explains the statistical association between sugar intake and mental health. And I think it justifies tobacco-like measures to limit both at the sort of individual and at the sort of broader society level. So thanks very much for your attention.